So Will Stephan is a climate change and earth system scientist from Australia, um, heading the Climate Change Institute of the Australian National University. And um, he has, although he's very broad, he does sometimes focus on climate change and climate change adaptation and the relationship between human beings and nature. He's also a, an advisor to the Australian government. I was. You was? <laughs> a, a few of us got sacked after the last oh, really? election. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I know that you have done extensive work on a project going around the whole of Australia and talking to right. people, audience, audiences like this, but also just the general public, and this debating and having discussions. And um, you were also heading the IGBP for many years. Yes. So you could have held this, this speech in Swedish, but no. there's, there's, <laughs> yes, there's, there's so many English-speaking people here. Okay. Well, I'll let you go on with it. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much, Agneta, and, and uh, uh, thanks for the invitation to come and talk to you. As the title indicates, uh, this talk is going to give you some scientific background of what you saw beautifully illustrated uh, uh, by Owen and colleagues uh, in that nice three-minute film. But you can see from the title, it does really one basic thing. It brings the long history of Earth together with humans. And you can see it in the word Anthropocene and epoch, which is a geological term. So as you might guess, I'm going to take some fairly long time frames. I'm going to start with a very famous uh, piece of evidence. In fact, it's very fitting that our uh, Volvo Environment Prize laureate is an expert on the cryosphere, because it's exactly where this data comes from. This comes from Antarctica, from a station called Vostok. As you can see from the timeline, it's about 400,000 years long, a little bit longer. But I've put in there the whole history of uh, what we call fully modern or anatomically modern humans. That's us. So we evolved in Africa somewhere halfway through that record. And we spent all of our time uh, in, this, in this period. For now, I'm only going to focus on one of the three. I'll get to the other ones later, the red line. That's a proxy for temperature. You see the regular pattern of ice ages, very jagged ice ages, a lot of variability, and fairly short warm periods until we hit this one, uh, which is a little bit longer a little bit, uh, about a degree colder than the ones before that. I won't go into that. We know the science of why that's so. The point is that for almost all of this time, we existed as hunter-gatherers only, in small groups, living fairly simple lifestyles. It's only during this last period that we've been able to develop agriculture and then move forward toward the societies we have today. So let me now explode out the last 100,000 years or so of this record. Uh, and go to the northern hemisphere. Now, this is Greenland, not so far from here. So here we see the last ice age, and at least in the North Atlantic area, it was quite erratic. There was a lot of variability here, a lot of warm spikes. But notice how different this period is compared to the period that went before it. This is an exciting period for humanity. We started to move around the planet. Uh, I've put up some of the important events in that movement of humans out from Africa to other parts of the world. But again, this is an interesting period. It certainly has its variability, but compared to what went on before, it's much more stable. And about 10,000 years ago, we saw the beginning of agriculture. Then we saw, eventually, great civilizations arising in Asia, of course, ones here in Europe, but also in Africa and in the Americas, built on the development uh, post-agricultural era. And here we are today in our contemporary societies. But something is happening to the planet today, and there's a lot of concern. In fact, Paul Critzen, when he blurted out that word at Cuernavaca in 2000, was drawing on his vast understanding of all sorts of things like this. Obviously, people are concerned about the climate, and we can see a destabilization of the Holocene climate. We can see it in average parameters like temperature, but what matters again for people are often these extreme events, which are part of the climate system anyway, but we now see some influences of climate change in terms of intensity, frequency, length uh, of these sort of events. All of these are taken in the last four or five years, and they all come from my country. They could have come from many countries around the world. So one of the things we tried to do in IGBP a little over a decade ago when we did our first synthesis was try to systematize what's going on to planet Earth under the 
the, the, the phrase global change. So obviously climate is part of that. But it's not the only part. We looked at things like the nitrogen cycle. There's pre-industrial, there's post-industrial. Just look how different the whole cycle looks. You don't have to look at it in detail. Uh, this big arrow that changes everything is human fixation of nitrogen. This is a map showing where there are large dams around the world, and you could put even more of them on today. But m most of the large rivers of the world now do not flow unimpeded to the ocean. They're dammed, water is taken off for human use. We can look at cultivation, agriculture, land systems, and we see that vast areas of the planet, maybe approaching 30, 35% of the planet, are now, have now been almost completely transformed for use by humans to produce food for now, over 7 billion people, and soon to be 9 billion people. And of course, we can look at climate. Uh, this is an earlier example of the type of system that hit the Philippines uh, more recently. This was nearly as strong, but it hit a fairly uninhabited part of Australia, so it didn't do nearly as much damage as the Philippine storm did. And of course, we can look at the iconic uh, global average uh, surface air temperature, which is a metric for uh, how the climate system is warming, becoming more energetic. So as part of the IGBP uh, synthesis, we tried to systematize this. And we did it, I think, in a fairly simple uh, but effective way. We looked at this period from 1750 to 2000. We chose 1750 because it was just before that period uh, that you saw in the Anthropocene video at the beginning, starting in England and then spreading. That started in, in the late 1700s. So we wanted to pick up the transformations that were occurring. Uh, and we put all of our indicators, I'll show you what they are, we put them on a linear scale. Now as we go through these, there are a lot of them, so that's why I want to show you the main pattern. Again, look at this period 1950. It came out in the film. And the, the images I'm going to show you now, the graphs, are the com put together were the line that you saw sweeping up in the bottom right hand corner of the video that you just saw. That was the data. So we wanted to do two things. We just saw, said, let's see how humanity itself has changed from the Industrial Revolution. And that's these 12 put together. And you can see what we used here. We tried to use indicators for these sort of things, population, economy, resource use, things like urbanization, globalization, transport and communication. Don't go through them in detail. Just look at, again, how they sweep upwards after the Industrial Revolution. But look how long it really took humanity to get going. And again, look at 1950. In each case, Either the slope of the curve changed, like in human population, or certainly in economy, or several things we take for granted today really didn't exist before 1950. We had some telephones, but certainly not like we have now. No international tourism, extremely few motor vehicles, and so on. Now, this is only humanity. We didn't say anything about the environment at this point. We just wanted to say, how can we characterize how we, as a collective species, as a, if you like, a superorganism, how we have developed over that last 250 year period. But then we said, of course, we know that something is happening out there in the natural world as well. So can we do the same thing? And that's what we've done here. These are indicators of various parts of the Earth system, put in exactly the same way, same time frame, same scales. These are the three famous greenhouse gases. This one in the upper left is CO2. There's the hole in the ozone referred to in the video. These are the only two that were uh, climate-oriented. The last six are effects, changes in the biogeochemistry flows of the planet, in the ecological structure of the planet. Now, these stop at 2000. We realize we've come on from then, and there are a, a group of people at the, the SRC and, and IGBP who are updating these. I wish I could show you them. I'm not going to show you them because hopefully they will be published very soon and they'll be available. And they'll show you some interesting changes uh, post-2000 in the human enterprise and in what's happening on the planet. So just watch this space uh, in the next couple of months when these come out. So an interesting way of visualizing this in a sort of static way was done by National Geographic. And they used a very simple equation. The impact uh, of humans is some aggregate of population, affluence or consumption, and technology. In other words, how many we are, what we consume, and how we produce the stuff we consume. Now, the interesting thing is National Geographic started at the year 1900, and that axis is population, there's technology, there's uh, consumption. 
This gives you a nice three-dimensional box, and it's filled with stuff, airplanes, fridges, cars, stuff we consume. Now, the interesting thing, you can see this little wedge down here. That's 1900. This is 2011. Now, when National Geographic did this, that's the only things they put. And I was a, an advisor on this figure, and I, I wrote to them and said, you've missed the entire point here. And they said, what do you mean? I said, put in the year 1950. And they argued. I said, why do you want to do that? It's going to be about halfway up. I said, no, it's not. Put it in, and you'll see what I mean. There's 1950. So from there, that little wedge to that little wedge is half a century. There's the next half a century. That's the great acceleration uh, in terms of a visualization. The second half of my talk, then, is going to look forward. That's where we've come to. Now I want to talk about the Earth as a system and where we might be going. So we go back to this same graph, and now we'll look at all three curves. This top curve is carbon dioxide. That's methane, two of the greenhouse gases. You can see how they're related. But from a complex systems point of view, we can note that the Earth exists, at least in the late quaternary, in two states. It exists in a, a cold glacial state that we've talked about, and of course it exists in these shorter interglacial states. But another thing we can see when we look at these three curves, CO2 temperature and methane, that there are things called limit cycles. They operate like this. When you look at CO2 oscillating between glac uh, glacial states and interglacials over 400,000 years, it's tightly constrained. It never drops much below about 180 or 200 ppm. It never goes much above 280 or 300. That's classic behavior of a complex system. It's a limited cycle or a limit cycle. You can see it for methane. You can see it for temperature, tightly constrained. It's a single system, clearly. Now we put on where we are on CO2, where we are on methane. Those arrows are drawn in the right time frame and at the right scale. This is a big shock. This is a big change, really blowing out these limit cycles of two important gases. And you might say, well, what's happening to the limit cycle of temperature? And now we have a really wonderful piece of work by one of the IGBP projects called PAGES, Past Global Changes, that for the first time gives us a 2,000-year temperature record uh, of land temperature around the planet. This is the first time we've had the southern hemisphere in here. This is all seven continents. Again, you see this fairly stable Holocene pattern. There's certainly ups and downs. But now, again, we see the limit cycle starting to be broken as temperature responds to the changes in radiative forcing. So now if we look at some IPCC projections, these are the ones from the fourth assessment. The fifth assessment report is roughly similar. You see that we're really looking now at only two centuries, and from where we sit today, we're looking at about a century. Uh, various projections for the future, depending on how sensitive the climate is to gases and how much more gas we actually emit. But what I want to do now is put these projections on the same time frame as that long-term uh, reconstruction of 2,000 years. So when you do that, that's what these projections look like. So this is going from, there's 1,900, 2,000, 2,100 is here where this vertical line is. So at the low end of the IPCC projections, we would be up here. But at the upper end, we would be here in 2,100. Now you can compare what that looks like uh, to the longer-term Holocene pattern of variability. It's a very big change, but it's entirely in keeping with breaking the limit cycles, just like we did for the greenhouse gases. So you can say, here's where we are now. But if we go to the worst case scenario, there's a lot of discussion about whether modern society can actually cope with a temperature change this strong and this quick. We can start with our basic physiology. How well will we live in a world that that's much hotter? How can we work? How will the ecosystems survive, the ones that we depend on for services, and so on? One of the things that Earth system scientists worry about as you go right up to the top is the fact that you may start tipping over parts of the climate system or parts of the Earth system. We see one already in the Arctic sea ice. That's diminishing rather quickly. A lot of these have to do with the cryosphere. We can talk about the stability of the Greenland ice sheet. If we raise the temperature too high, we may be committed to losing that. Outburst of methane when permafrost me melts, that's another concern. We see a bit of it happening, not very much at present, but it could get worse. And of course, there's concerns about what's happening in Antarctica as well, particularly West Antarctica, which appears to be less stable than the East. And there are other parts of the Earth's system that may change rapidly. 
go over tipping points as the temperature rises. So again, from a complex systems point of view, what this is telling us is that we may not, in the long term, end up anywhere along this scale. There may be another state of the system, a much warmer state, perhaps even an ice-free state. So the argument goes like this. This is the two-degree guardrail. And if we can manage to stay within that or close to it, there's a very good chance that dampening feedbacks will actually bring us back down toward a Holocene-like state, a state of stability. So there's still hope that we can get this system under control. And a complex system point of view actually gives you more hope that if you stabilize the climate around two or not much more, you may see a slow return back to Holocene conditions. But there may be a global tipping point somewhere where too many of these subsystems, ice systems, biosphere systems tip. And if that's the case, we may transition eventually to a very much warmer, basically ice-free state of the planet. It's a stable state. It's been there before. So we know that, that the Earth can do that. So I think from a complex systems point of view, uh, it both simplifies uh, but also makes, it, makes a stronger imperative that we stay within this two-degree guardrail. The last point I want to make is this is a lot about climate, but very recently there is a suggestion that the biosphere itself may have a tip, global tipping point, and that if we change, convert too much of the land to human-dominated landscapes, we may hit a point that even without a big shift in climate, we may shift to very rapidly to a completely different biological or biospheric state of Earth's system. There's a lot of discussion around this sort of research, uh, but we've seen mass extinctions in the past where the Earth, in fact, has behaved like this. So, that's where I want to leave you. You'll hear a lot of people talking in more detail about the, the um, future of the Earth. But, in fact, it's a very open question. This is the good Anthropocene, the bright future. Fireworks sitting on the beach, enjoying a, a New Year's Eve on, in Western Australia. Or, is there something looming there we need to be aware of? Are there some clouds coming in on the horizon that if we're not careful, we may not end up in this future, but in that future. So I'll leave you with that and, and let the other speakers tell you uh, more of the good news.